something that you can't possibly put a number on is playoff hockey, third period, Rangers tied, come off a big penalty kill, the adrenaline that that crowd adds to the team for the next three, four shifts. Playing in a completely unemotional you know, venue, how do you guys handle that, if at all? Well, it's going to be a challenge for everybody. So our challenge is going to be no different than all the other teams in this playoff situation. So you know, that's going to have to come from, you know, the desire and the will to win hockey games. And I think internally, regardless of the crowd, I think when you do have a successful penalty kill at a key time, I think human nature kicks in for both teams. I think obviously it gives the team that just killed the penalty a jolt. And I think it puts a team that maybe didn't score or generate much momentum off of that kill. It might deflate them a little bit. So, you know, how that power play evolves, you may not score. I think you can also gain some momentum off a of power play if you've got a lot of chances and you sustain some zone time and, you know, you, you just don't happen to score on a power play. There are a lot of things that goes to it. So, you know, I, I really believe that human nature will kick in for, on both sides of that scenario. And I don't think the crowd, not having a crowd would be that big of a difference. You have mentioned that the defense was such an important part of the turnaround in the second half. I, how much of that do you think was strategic or structural? And how much of that do you think was, you've talked about a lot of the players that you have being offensive minded guys that at the lower levels, you know, weren't relied on to play a lot of defense. They were scorers, especially the forwards and even some of the defensemen. Uh, how much of that was just getting this young group to really buy into it versus the structural strategic stuff? I think the, the buy-in piece and the trust factor was a lot bigger part of it. Guys just growing and evolving and understanding what it takes to have success in the National Hockey League level. Or maybe we were teaching a little bit better. Uh, maybe they were getting our message a little bit louder and clearer. But I think overall, I really believe it was just the evolution of a bunch of guys having better, you know, understanding of what it's going to take to have success in the National Hockey League. And I again, I go back to the fact that you can't play good team defense if you don't really trust each other. And I thought that our guys found a new level of trust amongst each other after the new year. Where do you think your guys are um, in terms of <clears throat> game readiness? Sorry, you've got a game in two and a half weeks or, you know, about that. Um, where are they? Is, is this training camp um, conditioning for them or are they way ahead of that? That's a good question, Larry. I think we're trying to find that out. And at the end of the day, we're probably never going to be in the shape or condition we were out of the gate the way we were when the season ended. But every team can, every team's going to be in that same situation. Our goal is to be in, the, in better shape than the other 23 teams. Everything's relative, and we've got to find a way to get there uh, in the next two and a half weeks. I have liked what I've seen the last two days. I love our energy physically. I love our enthusiasm mentally. Guys are standing, you've got to kick them off the ice here after practice. So uh, there's a lot of good things going on right now. We're going in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. Uh, you've had, you obviously had a long time to rewatch a lot of games, rewatch a lot of practices. And when it comes to Artemi Panarin, who today gets the finalist for the Ted Lindsay Award, as you rewatched, as you rewatch practice games, whatever, was there anything that you saw, any aha moment or anything that you saw that you hadn't noticed or didn't pay too much attention to about his game that enabled him to have the season he had that that isn't so obvious to just you know the eye as you're watching a game well we've touched on this uh you know when you are third in the league in scoring lead the league in five on five points and you're plus 36 which is a colossal difference between all the other guys that he's measured up against and you and i've talked about this separately um you know, I think his stats really speak volumes to the type of season he had. And I, everybody pays attention to his offensive skill set and his wizardry. But, you know, the little things he does in the D zone, you know, I remember putting him on the ice when we were up by a goal early in the season, six on five, and he looked at me like I was crazy. And I thought, well, I mean, I want you out there because I know when the puck's on your stick, you're going to do something good with it. So, you may not, you know, sprawl out to block a shot, but you're going to put yourself in a great position, positioning where a puck might come to you. So for him, I think he understood the magnitude of coming to New York, uh, the impact he was going to have on this organization on and off the ice, and he embraced it. He never shied away from it. And, you know, he did, watching those films and watching everything that we did over the break, uh, nothing surprised me because it was something that we all knew here. With, with Kako in particular, I heard you say during the pause that when, you know, in your conversations while he was in Finland, that he just seemed comfortable. 
and you, the four month layoff is essentially, you know, it's like a off season. Do you think that there were particular areas of his game or even his physique or his quickness, his skating, anything that, that you felt like he really focused on it and you and through two days of practice have seen a difference with? More, it's more the mental piece of it, you know, and I've said this a lot about him when you're 18 years old and you move to a new country you've never lived in and it's your second language and you're playing in a league you've never played in and it's just so, and the expectations are what they are for him. It's just, there's, there's just so much to it and you're living with a family and, you know, <clears throat> you're the youngest guy in your team and there's just so many hurdles for these young players that they face, not just him, but, you know, it's not, not a coincidence that Jack Hughes had similar numbers and hear similar situation to what went on in New Jersey. So I just think it's just a guy who's going to come back and feel more comfortable and realize what this is going to entail and what, what it takes. He knows everybody. He's more comfortable with everybody personally. He's more comfortable with people professionally. And I just think it's, you know, it's just the development of a young, really good hockey player. I know we, we ask you a lot about the goalies, but one, one of the things that's got to be very difficult as a coach, and you're not alone in this, there's probably half the teams that are returning that don't have a set number one that they are guaranteed to use in game one or that they play. So I was wondering, what's the checklist that you go down to evaluate? Because you don't have six exhibition games here and you're – you're using, you know, five-on-five five scrimmages in pra- at the end of practice. You know, you might have an inter- inter-squad scrimmage. But what's the checklist you go down to evaluate um, who starts? There's one line I look at, who's stopping the puck. It's the checklist. And, I, you know, I don't know enough about the position other than when the puck's going in the net and when it's not. And, obviously, we're very fortunate to have Ben Warlair here as our goalie coach. He certainly will give me his opinion and you know, the way things are going. But... And we're going to play a lot of, we're going to, like I said, we're going to scrimmage quite a bit. So we'll get a feel what these guys are going to look like in game-like conditions, which is going to go a long way in deciding how we're going to approach uh, the first game. That being said, it's not just about what we see in these last next two and a half weeks. You know, the regular season is going to play a role in, in who's going to get the knock. Yeah, hi, Dave. Uh, getting back to Panarin a little bit, you talked a little bit about what, you know, what he has done on the ice, which we saw. But... You also have talked in the past about, um, you know, what he does for you in the room. So I wonder if you could, you know, I mean, he's a finalist for, for the Players' Player Award. I wonder if you could just kind of go over some of the things that he, that he has meant to your team in, in, in terms of uh, this season, you know, just as a guy in the room and, and whatever, you know, on that end of it. Well, you guys know this is a long season. And there were some long, dark days during the course of a hockey season. And one of the things that he does, he comes here every day with a smile on his face, practices with passion and enthusiasm, doesn't have many bad days, if any at all. Uh, guys want to be around him. He's a great teammate. Um, and when you know, you get a guy with that skill set and a guy who's with one of the three finals for the Lindsay Award, Ted Lindsay Award, it's just so impactful in your locker room, especially for these young players. 